Thank you. Thanks, Alana, um, and thanks everybody for having me. Um, I'd like to just begin by acknowledging that we're meeting on the country of the Bindal people, um, as the sovereign nation um, which has never ceded sovereignty, um, and just sort of that sort of underpins it all. Um, what I'm going to do today is a little bit of a mishmash of, of two things, so um, I hope that it comes together. Um, one is the presentation of the results of the Athena Swan um, research process and the action plan that we developed from that. But I'm also going to just try and weave in a little bit of thinking that we've been doing recently about the process of creating this, of doing this research. Um, because I'm giving a paper in a couple of weeks at a, a gender equity conference about just this. So you get some preliminary ideas. Um, the argument of that paper that we're doing, in pro that, that sort of in-process paper, is that um, a lot of the strength of the JCU approach to this Athena Swan process, which you know we don't know the outcome of it yet, but regardless of whether we get the award or not, um, we produce a really substantial document about what gender inequities exist here and plans for how to how to move towards equity. Um, and part of that strength was the collaboration between STEM researchers and Haas researchers. Um, in contrast, I think a lot of other universities have STEM researchers. Um, and, and so uh, it's a bit more about the data and less about the, the sort of structural issues and the theories and the, um, the quality of research, which was a big part of, of what we did at JCU. So we want to sort of privilege the collaboration rather than any particular uh, form of knowledge. So here we go. Um, start off by, uh, again, acknowledging the sovereign nations. Um, the self-assessment team, which I'll refer to as the SAT um, members, um, we were chaired by Ian Gordon. Um, we had members, Real Harrison, who's in the Vice Chancellor's Office, Ina Sukowski, who's social work, uh, Mia, Damian Watson, me, Budmi Mulau Aduli from DTHM, Bradley Smith from the Research Office, Sandip Kamath from DTHM, Jan Strugnall from Agriculture, um, Lalita Simpson, who's a CSE postgrad student, Kristen Perry from HR, and Damian Dunn from HR. Um, and the people with asterisks are the co-authors of the paper that is in process, so I just wanted to note them in particular. Um, Elise Howard was our research assistant, and I'll talk about her role in a bit. Jean Fenton, really, she was the HR person who's left JCU now, but she drove the process for about a, a year, which was kind of the, the foundational year of us getting anything done, so I want to really acknowledge her. Um, Rhea Hagahara did some statistical analysis, and Emma McBride was on the SAT um, and left, but contributed quite a lot before she um, left us. And I also want to just acknowledge the, the research participants and I genuinely don't know who they are. It was all an anonymous process. Um, and everybody who's contributed to the research that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but just a bit of background for those of you who haven't spent <laughs> two or three years thinking about this. Um, and maybe these terms, Sage and Athena Swan and, and everything are not as familiar to you. This Athena Swan process that JCU is in the, the middle of right now um, is a pilot program in Australia, but it's been running in the UK since um, 2005, I think. I don't know if that's up there. Um, 2005 or 2008, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so it's been going in the UK for a while. Um, they've expanded it in the UK so that it's not just about STEM, it's also about, um, their acronym is awful, but HAPS, we call it HAPS in Australia. Um, they call it Arts, Social Sciences, Law, Humanities, and Business, A-S-S-H-L-B, <laughs> which sort of doesn't pronounce very well, but we stick with hats. Um, they've expanded in the UK to look more at intersectionality rather than just focusing on gender. Um, and so Australia's trialing this with those innovations already happening in the UK, and so in the back of the mind of the Australian pilots, pilot program, um, but still the pilot in Australia is focused on STEM. There is some imperative to include intersectionality within that, but the focus is really on gender equity and diversity in STEM, in research, so universities and research institutes. 
Um, and so the process is that universities applied to be part of the pilot program. Um, JC, you didn't join the pilot in the first cohort, but thanks to some um, hard lobbying from people who I know, some of them are in the room, um, we did make it into the second cohort. Um, so we then had two or three years to prepare an application, which was um, the product of lots and lots of research. Um, and the application needs to lay out what the current state of things are at JCU and an action plan for um, improving. Um, the application is currently undergoing a peer review process um, and we'll find out in a couple of months whether we're successful or not. If we're successful, we get what's called an Athena Swan Bronze Award. And the Bronze Award doesn't mean we're doing things well, but just that we know where the problems are and what we need to do about them. To continue having bronze, it's a three-year accreditation. To keep having it after that three years, we need to have improved. Um, and the, the Athena Swan group, the SAGE group, is deciding what silver might look like in Australia. Um, so it's only bronze awards that are being given out right now. Um, so the key thing is recognizing that gender equality is important for um, good, I mean, it's, it's a social justice imperative, right? Like, of course we need it, but also it's good for um, thinking and making sure that the decisions that are made are the best, that the science is the best, and so on. Um, so JCU's participation in Athena Swan arose at a, a particularly interesting time. Um, so we've done the research largely between 2016 and 2018. In February 2016, JCU launched the Respect Now Always uh, campaign, which was part of a university, well, universities-wide initiative responding to sexual harassment and sexual assault um, that was led by Universities Australia. Um, the gender self-assessment team was formed just, just shortly after that Respect Now Always campaign was launched. Um, and then about a year into the process, JCU had our own um, sort of noteworthy sexual assault case that hit the news and led to the broader review um, happening. So the broader review is separate from the gender equity stuff, but obviously it's interrelated issues. Um, so we had some members in common on both the broader panel and the, um, the self-assessment team, but we're talking about sort of overlapping but different um, issues right now. Oops, gone too far. So um, the self-assessment team considered lots of different options for methods for collecting data. Um, and we all agreed from, from very early on that we wanted both quantitative and qualitative data. And so we had lots of discussions about whether it was best to do the quantitative first and then do qualitative to fill in the gaps or do it the other way around. We ended up doing both lots of data collection and analysis together um, and then sort of filling in gaps where we needed to. So it was a very mixed methods research process. We did focus our research, um, particularly the qualitative research on women in recognition that there are these unquestioned ways of working. It's just things that happen in, in the university and in offices and in, in labs and in classrooms. Um, and they're often invisible. Um, and therefore, we don't really reflect on them and think about them. Um, but they're only invisible to the people who benefit from those ways of working. Um, the people who are at the sort of bottom of the hierarchy are quite aware of what those unquestioned ways of working look like. And so we wanted to ask women about those ways of working and those things that just happen without anybody thinking about it. Um, so in the words of Ahmed, um, she said, Sarah Ahmed says that when you become a feminist, you find out very quickly what you aim to bring an end to, some do not recognize as existing. Um, and it's that process of, of trying to figure out what is it that some people can see so clearly and other people don't even know is there. Um, that's what we were trying to do in this research project. Um, however, when you do research just with women, lots of people say, what about men? Um, and that's a very legitimate question in this discussion of gender equity because um, it's, not, it's not women who can fix the problem. It needs to be a problem that is addressed from, from everybody, basically, and then from the top down as well as from the bottom up. 
So we did um, three forms of data collection and men were involved in two of those, qualitative and quantitatively we, we did comparisons across men and women for all of the data that we looked at. <coughs> um, the three qualitative data methods provided really robust um, information and understandings about gender equity at the university. But the interesting thing is that the research itself also acted to raise awareness and kind of get people thinking about things in a way that already started the change process. Um, so it was in, in focus groups that women were coming together, realizing that they had shared experiences and thinking about ways of problem solving before we even got to the, the report stage, let alone the action plan stage of this. The other thing that we really wanted to make sure that we did well was ensure that potential research participants trusted the research process um, so that they could come and open up about things that are sometimes uh, quite difficult to talk about, um, that might have been issues that women were afraid that if they spoke up about and were named, they might lose their jobs or suffer other consequences, more informal consequences in their workplace. And that was definitely something that when women came and, and shared their stories, they wanted to make sure that they were anonymous. Um, they didn't want any repercussions from that. So um, we hired a research assistant, Elise Howard, who was a casual staff member, no power to make any, any um, decisions over women's employment, um, but also experienced a lot of the same issues that they were talking about. So, um, in, that pro in that way, we were able to ensure trust, and we also made sure that everybody who participated knew who were the committee members who were responsible for making things happen with this research. So they trusted that they weren't just going and talking for an hour or two, but that actually something would come out of that, that we're going to take their data seriously and hopefully bring about some change from this. Um, so we had, as I said, three research methods. Mm -hmm. The first of these was online anonymous testimonials, or sort of online surveys. We did it six times. Um, so each time we asked some basic demographic data and then uh, one of those questions that you can see on the slide, open-ended, um, ranged from very short responses to some quite lengthy responses that people typed in. Um, so you can see it was open to men and women, but it was almost exclusively women who um, responded to those. Um, and the response rate was, you know, not statistically significant by any means, but as an open-ended question that was sent out in, I think it was November, <laughs> December, um, across the six weeks, we were pretty impressed that we got those numbers, really. Um, and we analyzed those using sort of thematic coding and um, compared them against the interviews and the focus groups, the other two data methods, um, to think about what were the, the most common responses. The, the kind of main method, I suppose, was the focus groups, which I've mentioned. We had a goal to recruit 40 women in three focus groups to capture three different employment experiences. So staff who have been here for less than three years, um, staff who had been here for th more than three years, and staff who have, casual staff, who have been employed on 15 or more contracts. Um, and what we found with the casual staff is really interesting because um, I think of those probably five women in that group, the lowest number of contracts was in the 60s. Um, so women were, the casual staff, not just women, were employed on contract after contract after contract after contract and not given ongoing work. Um, a number of women in our focus groups uh, stopped having numbers, you know, your contract has, your job has a number, uh, but it's only a two-digit number, so once they get to 99, it goes to AA. Um, and so we had women who are in like the AWs of their contract number. So the, the level of casualization is extreme. Um, JC is no different from other universities in that, but it was interesting to note. Um, so we set out to recruit 40 participants. We sent this email, unfortunately, on a Friday afternoon, again in late October, um, and we're going all. How many times can we send this email out without being really annoying? Um, but in fact, we came in on Monday morning and 87 women had said they were interested in Townsville and 40 in Cairns. So we increased from three focus groups to nine focus groups. Um, and of everyone who, who actually made it to the sessions, there were 53 women um, in total. 
Um, and I've spoken about how women kind of came to realize that they had shared problems through the focus groups. And they kind of, in addition to being a data collection method, were a change process in themselves. And then the third qualitative method was in-depth one-on-one interviews with senior staff members. Um, and they were chosen um, because they've been around for a while um, and in some cases have been involved in former uh, attempts to improve equity in the university. Um, so that was six women and three men. Um, all of the qualitative data was collected by Elise Howard, the, the research assistant, and it was all de-identified before it came to any of the um, Staff, staff members who are on staff permanently. Um, and we had quantitative uh, data analysis, which was led by Mia and, and Bradley Smith. Um, and that data was collected from HR, from Cognos, and then you know, we'd get a bit of data from the GRS or, or wherever we needed to, to get that data from to fill in the gaps. So in terms of the qualitative data analysis, um, we wanted to center the, the lived experience of women and um, still have it be a robust data analysis. So we transcribed, we, well, we had the, the focus groups and interviews professionally transcribed, um, and then went through and looked for um, these, these issues. I want to get to the data, so I'm going to just skip through this data analysis stuff. I'll talk to you about it afterwards if you want. Um, but one of the things that I want to do a bit in the, the rest of the paper is think about some misconceptions that are widely held, um, but that are data challenged. And those things you'll see are highlighted in blue. They're not the things that I actually think. <laughs> um, so just a bit of an overview. JCU is a mid-sized university. We have about 22,000 students and 4,700 staff. Um, and you can see in this table that we have a female-dominated workforce overall, um, especially professional and technical staff, only slightly female-dominated in academic staff. Um, and that's based on full-time <coughs> um, in, in terms of headcount, um, the academic staffing profile is, is more female-dominated. Um, and I think that has to do with casual, casual staff. When we narrow it down to academic staff, um, we can see that, again, that women are more likely to be employed at casual um, than, than the average, um, and less likely to be employed in continuing positions than, than the average. Um, and amongst the academics, what this graph shows you is the number of, the, the, sorry, the percentage of women at each academic level, A, B, C, D, E, um, and these lines are the, are the black line is JCU, and then the two are the two divisions, um, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the center of excellence, you all, are mostly employed by the College of Science and Engineering, no? Um, when we collected this data, there were only three academic staff listed for, for this place, um, so I'm not sure if you're in the, the DTES line or if there's, there's something else going on there, and maybe me, I might be able to eliminate that a little bit. Yeah, I think we always get the center of the base on separate from that. Okay. So I will, I think I have, I have a slide in just a second about the center of excellence. I just want to point out that um, we do have intersectionality in mind um, throughout the whole report. It's quite hard to do in terms of the data that we have at JCU. Our HR system doesn't really capture things like um, race and ethnicity um, or disability or any of these things very well. But we do know that women's experiences are not homogenous at JCU. Um, and the testimonials in particular uh, drew out some of these stories that demonstrate that we still have diversity problems beyond gender equity. So you can see here somebody talking about experiencing racial microaggressions. Um, and what this graph shows is uh, that the ratio of indigenous women to indigenous men on staff it used to be uh, quite quite a big gap between them, and it is getting smaller, but not because we're hiring more Indigenous men. It's because the overall staffing of Indigenous people is declining quite dramatically, um, which is a problem that we've, we've pointed out and made clear um, to the university there. We do need more research on, on this to think about whether um, the women who remain are in 
academic positions, what kinds of levels. Anecdotally, we know a lot of Aboriginal women professors and associate professors have left the university. Um, and so there's a lot of professional and technical staff left in this data rather than academic staff. Um, here's a slide about this center. Um, we know in the application that we submitted that the Center of Excellence has some really great policies um, that are kind of a best practice that the university should think about how we could do more broadly. Um, so my understanding is that that's wrong, that bullet point about the academics being employed in CSE. Um, clearly it's just a, a data thing. Um, but what I will note is that some of the things that we noted as improvements are probably to do with um, the Center of Excellence policies and practices. Um, and this analysis, this one in particular, comes from Bradley Smith. Um, so what this graph shows is the number of women, the percentage of women at the academic levels across from 2007 until 2016. Um, and there's this rise here at level D, and Bradley reckons that's because of a cohort of women who have come up through the ranks at the Center of Excellence in the last um, 10 years or so. Um, so in terms of the statistics, we're talking about STEM with two M's, so that's the, the medicine and health disciplines as well as the sort of traditional um, hard sciences, technology and engineering. And when we combine them, things look better than they are um, because medicine is, and well, health, the health disciplines in particular, are heavily female dominated. Um, so I'll give you some, some statistics that show that in a bit. These are the key themes that came out of their qualitative data analysis. Um, so I'll, I'll focus in on some of these uh, briefly. Um, but uh, so the first one is the acceptance and expectations of women. Um, and so this is one of the common misconceptions. JCU doesn't have a gender equity problem. We have a female vice chancellor. We have a female chief of staff. We have a female, um, I don't know what's Trisha Brand's position. Um, we have lots of women in high profile positions. So how do we have a gender equity problem? Um, and so the theme that came up in our research was that the acceptance of women in leadership is reasonably low and the expectations of those women in leadership are quite high. Um, so this one isn't a quote from our research participants, but it's something I've heard um, a lot over the years. Um, so some data on women in leadership specifically. This graph um, shows the number of women in dean and associate dean roles for the HAS disciplines and the STEM disciplines, and then the senior leadership positions for so the DVCs and, and so on. Um, and this is the one that's, that's interesting because this STEM data, um, you can see that it looks like there's an, an over-representation of women in these leadership positions, but all of these women are in health sciences and all of these men are in CSE um, in, in this data. So um, although we have some, some women in leadership positions for sure, um, there's still inequality that's happening there. And this, this table shows the, uh, the annual reporting that the university does to the Workplace Gender Equity Agency, with GIA, um, which separates staff into managers and non-managers. And so these institutions, all these workplaces, have to report on the number of women and men in manager and non-manager positions. And they also break it down into um, casual and continuing positions. Um, and so what you can see here is that we are, you know, we're moving closer to, I mean, women are overrepresented in the workforce overall, we know that. In terms of managers, we're moving closer to parity, but it's still um, less than 50%. So although we have some high profile women, um, overall, <coughs> the, the sort of invisible men <laughs> are, are men primarily in the university. Um, and this 42% this figure is noteworthy because um, women make up 62% of the overall workforce. Um, so, you know, if we were expecting that to be equal, we would, we would expect to see that closer to 62%. Um, this is the academic levels uh, across the university. So women um, at different academic levels, the white bars are HAS disciplines and the gray bars are STEM disciplines. Uh, the dashed line across that is the 52% that women, women make up 52% of academics at the university. Um, so you can see there's a clear de de decline there. Um, and 
it shows us that there is a very big problem of underrepresentation of women in STEM, um, but the decline is consistent across the whole university. So again, um, despite having a woman as a vice chancellor, there's, there's an underrepresentation problem that's happening here. Then in terms of the expectations of women in leadership, um, our research participants told us that they have really high expectations. They want these women to, to be the best, um, but to be the best in different ways than they want male leaders to be the best. Um, so research participants felt like there was a lot of value in having access to women in leadership positions, but they felt like they didn't really have access to them. Um, they wanted mentoring, but there wasn't a lot of mentoring going on. Um, and a lot of staff were disappointed in or disillusioned with the leadership of JCU. Um, I'm not sure if that's uh, a general attitude here, but it certainly is if you're in other parts of the university. Um, there was a certain style of leadership expected of women. So women were expected to be consultative, open to dialogue, um, and ready to listen. But participants acknowledge that this style of leadership is not valued, that women to get to that leadership position need to engage in those sort of more, um, uh, well, less consultative ways of doing things and, and do that sort of more competitive approach to rise to those higher ranks. So they recognize this catch-22 for women in leadership, um, but still were very disappointed in, in the leaders at JCU. Um, the next theme that I'll talk about is the acceptance of work family adjustments, uh, which is one of those things that the center seems to do quite well. In policy, JCU has pretty generous parental leave applications. This is a summary of, of what those are from the enterprise agreement. Um, our data, our qualitative data also indicate that there is at least a surface level acceptance of people having caring responsibilities, particularly caring for children. But that acceptance is often conditional on people not inconveniencing their colleagues. That we're okay with people having uh, adjustments for their family, so long as it doesn't mean more work for the rest of us. Um, so participants told us stories indicating that women with caring commitments are constructed as a problem, rather than the problem being the sort of lack of funding, the lack of staff, um, the culture of excessive workloads, and that um, all of those conditions that we exist in, this sort of uh, Cost, the, the lean times that we're in at JCU, we hear all the time about. Um, favor workers who can put in long hours and who don't, don't have commitments outside of work. Um, so during focus groups, we actually had participants reassessing whether they want to be in a university, whether they want to be academics or professional staff, but whether um, they even want to be working full time necessarily. So that was, that was an interesting outcome that we didn't expect from our, our research process. Um, so we do have these provisions in place for career breaks and part-time work, but applying them in practice is difficult when the narrative of gender equity keeps the focus on the mother as a problem. So what do we do about this problem of this woman leaving the workplace to go and have babies or raise her children um, instead of focusing on uh, all of the benefits of having um, parents involved in the workplace? And so this relies on um, this sort of concept of the standard employment relationship, um, or the, the SER, the SER-centric orientations of the workplace. So in this system that we have, which isn't just a JCU system, staff are rewarded for working well beyond their workload. Um, so I don't know anyone who works 37 and a quarter hours a week. Um, it's kind of a hilarious joke when we, when we think about how many hours we get paid for. Um, so we're rewarded, we're expected to work beyond that um, 37 and a quarter hours. Um, and this uh, standard employment relationship comes from a time when men went to work and women were at home raising children um, and doing all of the housework commitments. So this standard employment relationship kind of has this ideal model of, of a male worker with a stay-at-home wife. And any other arrangement from this standard employment relationship is regarded as a deviance. Um, it's a problem that needs to be solved. 
And then the university and other institutions think about the need for change relying on those individuals rather than a system that needs to change to be more inclusive of a variety of ways of relating to the workplace. Um, so generally our research participants felt disadvantaged by career breaks and they said that a year off has <coughs> more than a year's worth of effect on their research performance. So it amounted to a lot longer outside of the workplace. Um, senior staff noted that as long as women continue to carry the burden of childcare commitments broader in society, it'll be difficult for women to keep progressing to more senior levels. Um, some of our participants reported hiding the fact that they had children from colleagues, particularly the newer staff um, didn't admit that they had children or they wouldn't discuss their caring or outside commitments until they were confident they'd been hired um, and couldn't be, um, have their contracts terminated. So they felt like discrimination was a very real possibility. So the next theme um, and, and, and myth is about hiring and promotion, leadership and management. So we have this idea, and I've had this, this line said to me by the director of HR, we have a merit-based hiring and promotion system. So gender shouldn't be um, a factor in this. Um, and we do, of course, we have a merit-based hiring and promotion system, but if we focus too narrowly on merit, we forget that some people have more opportunities to demonstrate and develop that merit than others. Um, so Universities Australia really, uh, released a report in November last year on sponsorship as opposed to mentoring. Um, and sponsorship means not just providing advice, which is mentoring, but creating opportunities for people. Um, and their, their report on sponsorship makes it clear how important this is to research and professional careers. Because the way that we build a track record is through being provided with opportunities. Um, and the point of the report is not that we shouldn't have sponsorship, but we need to do so transparently um, and with a mind to equity. So if we only sponsor people who are like us, then the people in the senior position are going to keep sponsoring um, you know, men from private schools or whatever their background is. So we need to sort of think about equity in that sponsorship and try and um, distribute those opportunities equally amongst people. And our senior staff interview participants did talk about how they are constantly looking out for talent. Um, so staff with the potential to offer long-term benefits to the university. Um, and they said that they offer those, those people intentional mentoring, professional support, access to leadership opportunities. Um, so they're kind of picking winners was one of the terms that was used. But they also acknowledge that they're likely to be missing out on lots of potential winners, people who could um, contribute in really profound ways to the university, but um, they miss them because of unconscious bias or they're on casual employment, so they don't actually get to see their full potential. Um, so there's this tendency to pick winners in the staff who look like what we expect a winner to look like, which is somebody without caring responsibilities, who's highly mobile, um, and who's able to prioritize their work above everything else. Um, so in terms of leadership, we also had an interesting concept come through the qualitative research, which is the concept of the anti-mentor, um, which is you see people above you succeed, but you don't like their means of getting there. They sort of reflect values that you don't want to employ in your own life. So they're the, they're the mentor of what not to do to get to that position, which we thought was an interesting concept. Um, the other thing that was just so clear from all of the research that we did was the difference between what we have on paper at JCU in terms of policy and what actually happens in practice. Um, there's both a lack of understanding of what our full entitlements are um, amongst managers as well as staff themselves, um, but also they're implemented quite variably. So we had women who talked about how they only really looked into their entitlements after a fair while of putting up with unfair practices. And then when they started to advocate for themselves, they were labeled a troublemaker and sort of were, treat, were marginalized from a lot of conversations. Um, but through the focus group conversations that women were having, they realized they weren't alone in their experiences and they were experiencing some systemic issues and they needed to undertake collective action. Um, 
So we have this kind of interesting dynamic that gets set up in the workforce that women think that an academic career is possible as long as women don't have care and commitments or if the policies change uh, or the policies to enable care and commitments are well supported by managers, by colleagues and so on. Um, but these policies are implemented at the manager's discretion in so many cases, which challenges this idea of a positive workplace culture. So women often feel guilty or lucky um, if they have a good manager, a good manager who follows the, the enterprise agreement, they feel lucky. Um, and so they, they sort of put in extra hours and things because they feel like they need to earn that luck or they feel guilty and you know they put in those extra hours. And um, we had women talking about staying up for you know hours, hours, hours after uh, soccer carnivals and whatever because they felt bad that they'd have to leave work an hour early to go to that thing. Um, and when people feel guilty or lucky, they don't really stand up for themselves was the other thing that came out of that research. So moving on to recommendations, like there's a lot more I could talk for three hours about what we found in our research, but I will spare you that. Um, we did develop an action plan, as I said. These are the recommendations that came directly from our participants. Um, they were around maternity leave, organizational change, creating collective spaces for women, improving professional development opportunities, um, more access to women leaders, and culture change from the top. Um, and these informed our action plan. Um, we have 47 actions in our action plan, and that was that has been approved by the Vice Chancellor's Advisory Committee. And um, they say they're going to do it regardless of whether we're successful with our Athena Swan application or not. Um, so look forward to those actions coming our way soon. So we want to make sure that everybody knows at least what some of them are so that we can hold people accountable. Um, the, this kind of, the actions are organized into six themes, these overarching sort of big picture things. Leadership and resourcing, and those are things that we needed the Vice Chancellor's Advisory Committee to um, promise money for. Um, communication and engagement, training, further research, and policy and procedural changes. Um, so I'll just, the, in addition to those six sort of practical themes, there's kind of some, some cliches that underpin our, our thinking about this action plan. One is that you can't manage what you don't measure. So we need to keep doing this research because until we actually see that women only make up 42% of managers despite being 62% of the workforce, we think that we don't have a gender problem here. Um, nothing will change if things don't change. Um, we need a systematic approach to systematic change, and it's uncomfortable to people who, have, who are currently comfortable. Um, so expect a little bit of discomfort. So just a couple of examples of actions that fit within these themes. For example, in our analysis of, of pay data, um, in general we found that there's a very small gap between men and women academics um, per level but an average of 2.49% gap, which um, is a result of things like allowances. Um, so some people getting paid extra in addition to their level C or level E or whatever salary, but also the starting income. In. So we're suggesting um, better analysis of this and uh, recording what, what level people start at and things like that. Um, things like uh, you know the, the sort of invisible work that we do at Inspire Me Week and Open Day and Uni Experience. I just did Uni Experience yesterday morning. Um, we're suggesting that colleges keep track of who does these things, just so that there's, if you keep track of it, then you can go, oh, this person hasn't done any all year. Maybe they could do the next thing, and maybe we could get some more um, gender equity in those activities. Um, and then I mentioned the, the need for more research in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, similarly in staff with disabilities, um, and so on. Um, in terms of we need to change the way that we do things, and these are, these are, some, these are also uncomfortable things, right? Um, we had a lot of participants tell us that they just aren't going to bother going for promotion. Um, so we have lots of quantitative data that shows us that when women apply for promotion, they're just as likely to succeed if a little bit more likely than men when they apply for promotion. 
There's lots of women who just don't want to apply for promotion anymore. So um, there is already a pretty massive overhaul of the promotion process underway. Um, it was supposed to happen for this year, but it's looking like it might be more like next year because of the way that things happen at JCU. Um, making sure that we have a consistent way of talking about rope research opportunity performance, what relative opportunity performance, um, and making sure that promotion panel members are adequately trained, not just in terms of understanding rope, but also um, unconscious bias and stereotypes and so on. Um, this systematic approach, um, so somebody suggested, and this comes out of the out of the participants, a university-wide mentoring program for women um, with, with making sure that the mentors and the mentees are well trained to make the most of, of that um, and thinking about that with regards to that sponsorship document so that it's not just about uh, giving advice but giving opportunities. Um, the, and this, this top one I think is really important that we have, we, we put out policies uh, and they seem, you know, maybe they're about risk aversion or whatever. So the, the classic example of that top one is um, the children at field sites policy, um, which changed a few years ago so that people could no longer bring kids to um, Orpheus Island and so on, uh, which dis, uh, disproportionately affected women who needed to bring their kids into the field with them. And the policy that, that they developed was all about risk aversion. So it was about um, making sure the university isn't liable if something bad happens to somebody's kids. Um, and we said, that's, <laughs> absolutely, we need to think about that. But we also need to think about what kind of gendered effects a policy like that will have. And it isn't just that we have women on the policy development committee. That's not enough. We need to, to actually ask the question, what effect will this have on women um, as opposed to men? And, and these kinds of things. And find that balance, right, between like safety and risk, but also like we're all people with families and responsibilities and can, can make decisions for ourselves in some ways. Um, systematic change is uncomfortable. Um, so one of the most uncomfortable ones that I've, I've raised to people, the thing that makes people the most uncomfortable is thinking about alternatives to student feedback. Um, and I know this isn't maybe as much of an issue for a research institute, but our research participants talked about getting extremely negative comments and extremely gendered comments on their student feedback surveys from teaching. Um, and there's lots and lots of research that student feedback surveys are, um, are deeply flawed for so many reasons. Um, and, but then when you, when you propose changing that system, people get really upset because if students can't provide anonymous feedback, then you know, what will they do? There's risks of, of retribution and low grades and these kinds of things. Um, but we need to be uncomfortable. We need to sit uncomfortably with that and think about the best way forward for those things. Um, an easy one is not having any all-male panels at any university events. It should be easy, um, but it isn't always. Um, so the next steps, like we submitted our application, as I said, in April. It's under review right now. We will find out our result in July, but it's embargoed until November because there's an appeals process. In the first cohort, five institutions were not successful out of 20 with their application. So it's not a guaranteed thing. Just because we submitted the application doesn't mean we'll necessarily get it. But I am hopeful. It was a very um, robust application. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a bronze award. <laughs> hopefully we have it for three years. And then we need to go through this process again, um, looking again at all of the data, looking at what actions happened, and if they didn't happen, why, and we really need to be able to justify why not. Um, and then we can either renew our bronze application or maybe move to silver when we see what that looks like. Um, so, sorry, that I talked for a little bit longer than I was expecting to. I do have the full report if there are questions about data that I don't have in my head, but otherwise, happy to take questions now.